Okay, welcome back to class, everyone. Welcome back here. And it's good to see that uh, we're still riding that wave of interest. People are still interested in the topic, so that's great. So this is going to be lecture three, or class number three, in our uh, short Creation Basics course. And uh, I just want to start with a word of prayer, and, and then we'll just trust God that this will be a, an enjoyable and helpful time for everybody, okay? So let's just go to the Lord together. Uh, dear blessed holy God, almighty God of creation, we come before you, Lord, uh, clothed in the righteousness of your dear son Jesus, and made acceptable in him, your beloved one. And we just thank you, Lord, for the privilege of prayer, and we thank you for the shed blood of the Savior, and his broken body, his resurrection from the dead, and his intercessory ministry also. We thank you, Lord, that we're guaranteed now bold access through the veil into the holy place, and Lord, we want to thank you that we can have this class, that we're free to do this. And Lord, we want to talk about important things, things that are connected directly to your gospel. So Lord, please help us today. Please be here in the person of the Holy Spirit to empower the teaching. And uh, Lord, to make this enjoyable and helpful for everyone. May these things be so in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Okay, guys, well, welcome back, and uh, today we want to talk about uh, the very good world that God created in the beginning, and uh, just as an aside, you remember we have Arnie Armstrong coming uh, May 1st to the 4th, so Arnie's going to, he'll be, he'll be teaching here that Monday evening, so obviously we won't have a Creation Basics class that day, but I'm thinking if, uh, if I don't dilly-dally, I might be able to knock off two lectures in this time slot so that we finish before Arnie comes. And then we don't like take, take a, uh, you know, one week off and then return for one more class. I think we might be able to do it today. But we'll see how this goes, okay? So what we want to do today, we want to talk about um, the doctrine of creation. And we want to compare and contrast it to our, I guess, our chief religious competitor in the marketplace of ideas concerning origins and early earth history. And that would be the evolution story. So maybe I can just draw a couple timelines on the board here. Creation looks like this, if we just take the Bible at face value, just as it's written, as uh, the Orthodox Jews regard uh, the early chapters as straightforward historical narrative. Uh, not this class, but I think maybe next week, uh, I think we look at the New Testament record and we'll see how did... Uh, Jesus, how did his apostles, how did the writers of the New Testament take those early chapters of the Bible? I think you'll see they took them as straightforward historical narrative. So if we do that, then um, of course you have God. God has existed from all eternity. God exists, you know, he existed timelessly, spacelessly, eternally. God is uncreated, greatest conceivable being, right, and all that. That we believe. And at a finite point in the past, God created the world. He created the heavens and the earth. And um, we say it happened in six days, like Exodus 20.11 says, right? And God made a very good world. Let's just call it very good. Genesis 1.31 says very good. So no death. No bloodshed. We're going to look at that. The Bible seems to go out of its way trying to describe for us a very good world in which nothing was killing anything. It was peaceful, beautiful, harmonious, well-integrated, <laughs> created order under the headship of God, ultimately, and entrusted to Adam, original man, all things under heaven. Well, you guys know what happened. We had a fall, and death entered because of the fall of man. That's Genesis 3. It's all review for us. This is all very basic. But uh, 1,656 years into creation, we had a, what, global flood, a deluge. Only eight people survived. Noah and his family and representatives of all land dwellers, air breathers, survived the flood, and that ushered in another world system, the world system that we live in today, and uh, God established Israel, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the patriarchs, became the progenitors, the patriarchs of 
national ethnic Israel, and into that nation came Jesus. He's Israel's Messiah, but the Savior of the world died and was resurrected from the dead, ascended to heaven, and he ushered in the church age. Here's where we are, the church age. And we think rapture, tribulation, and second coming of Jesus, and then the kingdom age. That's sort of summary fashion, right? There it is. There's, there's Bible history. It's right there for you. And the whole thing, really, it seems to me, if you add up the dates, is somewhere in the neighborhood of six to 7,000 years for the whole thing, seems to be. I mean, you can look at the ages of the patriarchs pre-flood, and you could say, well, maybe they're rounding, rounding up the ages or this or that. that. That may inject, what, an error of 20 years here and there, maybe, but really, you can't really manage, I think, a created order that's more than six or 7,000 years, taking Genesis at face value. Now, the evolution story is quite a bit different. So the evolution story says what? Well, if you're Darwinian, nothing. There was nothing. No space, no time, no energy, no potentiality. And somehow the universe came into being from nothing, by nothing for no reason. And uh, it's not our purpose to track down all the philosophical implications of that, but can I just say, if this is what you believe, nothing than something, you've got a serious epistemological problem. In other words, you have a problem with your theory of knowledge. You've just told me that in your worldview, chance is ultimate. Anything could happen at any time for any or no reason. And that is the death knell to any intelligent scientific research because science is looking for law-like regularity and predictability. You have no reason to look for those things if you believe this story right here. See? And what, what do we call this? The Big Bang? The Big Bang story. Whoops. The Big Bang story, where the universe popped into being uncaused out of nothing. And um, what evolved first? Does anyone know? What element was first to evolve? John, you must know. Do you remember? They say, well, of course, you have all this chemical evolution taking place. And then the first element was hydrogen. Colorless, odorless, invisible gas, hydrogen. And hydrogen gas coalesced, changed, morphed, evolved into everything you see today. I mean, not just human beings, right? But like beautiful, intelligent human beings who can abstract that all from hydrogen gas. So you've got this... Um, chemical and uh, stellar evolution where you've got uh, stars and planets and galaxies and everything's sort of evolving over endless ages of time, including you know, you've got planets and all the rest of it. And uh, Earth, by the way, Earth evolves somewhere, they say, 4.6 billion years ago. The Earth, a hot molten mass at first which we now know cannot possibly be true, because some zircon crystals were discovered in the Jack Hills Formation in Australia, and uh, these zircons contain oxygen isotopes that only form in running water, and these are supposed to be the oldest substances, oldest, oldest substances on Earth, 4.4 million years old, billion years old. So now science has to... I don't know what they're going to do with that. I mean, that's a big problem, but at any rate, that's what they say. And then you've got all this... Um, Biological evolution, evolution, and man, man is a late arrival. He is like 200,000 years ago, we have Homo sapiens sapiens. Of course, he has evolved from ape-like creatures, began walking the earth somewhere around 6 million years ago, and uh, here we are today, we've lost most of our hair. Right, right, Dan, me and you. <laughs> we'll off those our hair. And here we are. Okay, so look, in terms of the time frame, very different. This entire thing is something like 15 billion years, as opposed to six to 7,000 years. Quite different. Quite different in terms of the order of events. Uh, if you are a Darwinist, then nothing created the Big Bang. If you're a theistic evolutionist, then God is the guy who 
detonated this thing called the Big Bang. It was a controlled detonation. Uh, engineers designed, intended to bring about all this evolution here. If you're a theistic evolutionist, that's what you believe. If you're a Darwinist, it's all naturalistic. God has nothing to do with it. But uh, the really big thing here for our purposes, and there's lots to think about, but this is a Bible basics course or a creation basics course, is by the time life evolves, let's say, I think it's like 3.8 billion years ago, they say, something like that. By the time life evolves here, the first life, some single solitary speck of life in the oceans, we'll say, the primordial sea, from that time until now, you've had, you've had death in the world. Death and bloodshed. A struggle for life. And you've got animals going extinct. First of all, these animals are ripping into each other. They're devouring each other. It's survival of the fittest. And um, from the moment biological life appeared, it's been struggling against itself to survive. And so animals imperfectly adapted for their environment are destroyed. And those who are better adapted survive. They leave offspring. And it just goes on and on over endless ages of time. Now, if you're an evolutionist, you're committed to the story, right? But if you're somebody who calls yourself a Christian, and you want to hang on to this evolution story and say that God did it, then we have to be prepared to face the, um, the theological and philosophical implications of this. And I just want to read a couple quotes to us here that might be uh, enlightening. Maybe you haven't thought of this before. But I want to read, first of all, from Charles Darwin, who is the modern, sort of like the modern popularizer of the evolution story, sort of a high priest of this religion. This is what Darwin said in The Origin of Species, last paragraph. He says, thus from the war of nature, the war of nature, from famine and death, the most exalted object which we are capable of conceiving, namely the production of the higher animals, directly follows. So on this view... Death brought man into the world, right? On the Bible's view, man brought death into the world by our sin. Totally opposite here, see? This is from Carl Sagan. Remember Carl Sagan, Cosmos? He says, the secrets of evolution are death and time. The deaths of enormous numbers of life forms that were imperfectly adapted to the environment and time for a long succession of small mutations that were by accident adaptive, time for the slow accumulation of patterns of favorable mutations. The secrets of evolution are death and time. Enormous amounts of death and enormous amounts of time. And this is another quote here. This is from Jacques Monod. He was a Nobel Prize winning biologist. He says, natural selection, this is evolution, this is Darwinism, Natural selection is the blindest and most cruel way of evolving new species and more and more complex and refined organisms. The struggle for life and the elimination of the weakest is a horrible process against which our whole modern ethics revolts. An ideal society is a non-selective society, one where the weak is protected, which is exactly the reverse of the so-called natural law. I am surprised, says Bueno, I am surprised that a Christian would defend the idea that this is the process which God more or less set up in order to have evolution. I'd be surprised too. That doesn't sound like he did it that way when you read Genesis. And finally, I'll give you one more quote. This is from a philosopher of science named David Hull from Northwestern University. This is what he wrote. Whatever the God implied by evolutionary theory and the idea of natural history may be like, he is not the Protestant God of waste not, want not. He is also not a loving God who cares about his productions. He is not even the awful God portrayed in the book of Job. That's funny he would talk about Job. Eh? <laughs> the God of Galapagos is careless, wasteful, indifferent, almost diabolical. He is certainly not the sort of God to whom anyone would be inclined to pray. And so there's the uh, philosopher of science and his perspective on this. This idea here, this evolution story... Is, is a nightmarish account of Earth history, the origin and development of life on the planet. And we really shouldn't blame God for that one, Be, particularly because that's not how he said he did it. So let's, let's go to the Bible, please. Let's go to uh, the book of Genesis, chapter 1. Genesis 1. 
just a couple of verses here. So Genesis 1, pretty easy to find in our Bibles, right? This is the creation account, by the way. Genesis 1 is the creation account. Genesis 2 will back up and give you a little more detail on things that happen on day 6 of creation week, but the account is Genesis 1. And uh, if we put in at verse 26, we're on the sixth day of creation week. God's already made the, the land animals on that day. Verse 26. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and every, uh, every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them, and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, See, I have given you every herb that yields seed, which is on the face of all the earth, and every tree whose fruit yields seed, to you it shall be for food. Also to every beast of the earth, to every bird of the air, to everything that creeps on the earth, in which there is life, I have given every green herb for food. Then God saw everything that he had made, and indeed it was very good. So the evening and the morning were the sixth day. The Bible is just really going out of its way, isn't it? To tell us that the world that God made in the beginning was a very good world. And it didn't have all those horrible features of the evolution story. No death, no disease, no mutations, no natural disasters, no bloodshed, none of that. Uh, God wants us to know that. That's really, really important. Now, you and I know that if we go to chapter 2 in the book of Genesis, that God uh, put the man that he made into a garden. Remember Genesis 2, I think it's verse 16, 16, 17. And God said, Adam, of all the trees in the garden, you may freely eat. Except one. Which one's that? The tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The day you eat that, Adam, is the day you die. So there, there it is. Okay, No death has occurred. If you eat of that, Adam, death is going to occur. And actually in Hebrew it says dying you will die. You'll become mortal, you'll begin to die, and then finally you're going to die, right? By the way, I, I just want to mention something here. This, if you're an animal lover, I'm an animal lover, I, lo I love animals. Except for my dog that got left with me. <laughs> no, that dog is different. <laughs> Anyone want a dog? It's not a long term demand, it's just 10 years. Yeah, okay. At any rate, I actually do love animals. And... Uh, so this idea that uh, God would set up this kind of um, mechanism, an evolution, evolutionary mechanism, to get higher and higher life forms on the planet, it sort of kicks out our God-given moral sensibilities and sensitivities, doesn't it? So the proverb, it's Proverbs 12 and verse 10. That proverb says that the righteous man regards the life of his animal, but the tender mercies of the wicked are cruelty. That's God's heart on the matter. So can we really believe the God who expresses this is the God that set up this, this evolution program and would have animals ripping into each other and dying horrible deaths and, be, and getting mutated too and limping along with infections and all this kind of stuff? Impossible. That, this is absolutely incoherent and it's uh, incong incongruent. The two ideas don't work together, right? I think you see that. I'm probably preaching to the choir here. But uh, God told Adam... Um, if you eat of the tree, there's going to be, a, you're going to die. Dying, you will die. And death, of course, signifies, among other things, separation. When you die, physically, the body becomes defunct, right? And your non-material nature component, your soul spirit, leaves the body. It's no longer, it's no longer causally active on this physical body. That's physical death, separation. But spiritual death is separation and estrangement from God. And the Bible talks about a horrible thing that's going to happen in the future. It's called the second death, where the wicked, the damned, will go before God on his great white throne, and their names will not be found written in the Lamb's Book of Life, 
and they'll be cast alive, it says, into the lake of fire. This is the second death. This is eternal conscious torment, right? So that's incentive to go and evangelize, isn't it? But um, God said this horrible problem got started when man deliberately, intentionally, willingly, and knowingly broke God's wise command. And you know how it happened, don't you? The serpent came into the garden, Genesis 3, deceived the woman who persuaded the man, Genesis 3, 17. Adam, because you listened to the voice of your wife. Now we've got big problems, right? <laughs> big problems. How does it go? That's the account of how the first woman ate the first man out of house and home. <laughs> Did you hear that one? <laughs> I heard another one too. It said the big problem uh, at the beginning wasn't the apple in the tree, it was the pear on the ground. <laughs> That's a cute one too. But uh, okay, so the Bible says that the wages of sin is death, right? Uh, Romans 5.12, through one man sin entered the world, and death by sin, and so death is passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. That's the amazing thing. That's the trade-off. And, th- and we, can't, m- we can't miss this. This is so important. So you've got... Uh, death here coming into the world because of man's uh, rebellion. And so now death is this temporary part of the created order. But you know, the Bible says when, when Jesus returns, there's going to come a time when he's going to make sure in his world there's no death. He's going to make sure that happens. You remember uh, Revelation 21? John says, right at the beginning of that amazing chapter, he says, I, John, saw a new heavens and a new earth. I saw heavenly Jerusalem coming down out of heaven like a bride adorned for her husband. And he goes on to tell you about that world, the new heavens and the new earth, wherein dwells righteousness forever, and there's no curse, and there's no death, there's neither sorrow, nor crying, or pain, for the former things have passed away. So the big problem that original man created is going to get undone by the last Adam, The second man, the heavenly man, Jesus. Perfect bookends, perfect perfect, uh, components of this story that coheres so nicely together, see? It's so important that we understand that. But here, if we're going to believe that the evolution story is true and earth has been supersaturated with death and bloodshed for billions of years before we even arrived on the scene, by the way... Uh, this, right here, this, this is your fossil record, right? Aren't fossils dead things? Fossils are the, are the remains of things that were once alive. They died, they got buried, and molecule by molecule, the organic stuff was washed out of the carcass to be replaced by mineral material, and fossils are now just rocks that look like the creature that died. Same shape, you know? Same size and shape. But fossils... On the evolution story, these fossils here, they represent life that has come and gone billions of years before man arrived. That means death is in the world before man shows up. Now how can we be expected to believe that Jesus in his physical death was paying for sin when death is already here supposedly? You know, it just makes much more sense. It's much more coherent to say, okay, we had a world with no death. Sin occurred, and that brought death into the world. So Jesus Christ came and actually tasted physical death because he was paying for it. He was treated like a sinner, the worst sinner. And he is going to fix it in his redemptive work and in his victorious return to the planet. He'll fix the world back the way it's supposed to be, no death. Now that coheres, hey? Doesn't that kind of work together? And so we have some wonderful verse passages in the Bible. Like, for example, um, you've got uh, Luke 22. Uh, It's in uh, Luke, is it 22? What did I have here? 29. 29, okay. 22, 29. And then Matthew 19 and verse 28. You've got this, the kingdom age is being uh, discussed and described by Jesus. And Jesus says in Luke, he says, okay, you men, you 12 disciples, 
you apostles, in the kingdom age, in the kingdom, he calls it, in Luke, you're going to sit on 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Wonderful. But then in Matthew 19, you have a parallel account there. It's, it's, it's Matthew's recollection. And Jesus says, you men that have followed me, you're going to sit on 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel in the regeneration, in the polygenesia, that's the Greek. It's doing Genesis again. Let's do Genesis again. The re-Genesis. We're going to do it over. We're going to do it better this time. The kingdom age is an age of restoration. So Acts 3.21, for example, um, after Jesus had already ascended into heaven, Peter stood up and gave this remarkable speech to Israel. And he says in Acts 3.21, he tells Israel, heaven must keep Jesus until the time of restoration of all things. And, and this is the consistent theme all the way through the Bible. Eden was lost. An Edenic curse has been, you know, you know, spilled out onto the planet now because of Adam's sin. The whole creation groans and travails together in pain until now. That's Romans 8. But the second man, Adam, is coming to reverse it and make it better. That's the constant theme uh, through Scripture. So if we go to um, Isaiah 11, maybe this is very familiar to you, but it's one of my favorite passages here. If we go to Isaiah 11... And again, Isaiah 11 is going to make sense to us as it's plainly written if you take Genesis as plainly written. Yeah, I just want to read the first 10 verses here in Isaiah 11. We're going to hear about the second coming of Jesus and we're going to hear about what he's going to do to the planet. Are you ready? Isaiah 11, verse 1. There shall come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse... Who's that? David's father, Jesse. King David has a dad. His name's Jesse. Okay. There shall come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. The spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, and the spirit of the knowledge and the fear of the Lord. His delight is in the fear of the Lord, and he shall not judge by the sight of his eyes, nor decide by the hearing of his ears. But with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. He shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips he shall slay the wicked. I mean, this, is, this all maps onto the things we hear about Jesus in the New Testament. Like in 2 Thessalonians, for example. With the breath of his mouth, Jesus Christ will consign the Antichrist to the pit. Just like that. Okay? Verse 5. Righteousness shall be the belt of his loins, and faithfulness the belt of his waist. The wolf shall dwell with the lamb, the leopard shall lie down with the young goat, the calf and the young lion and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze, their young ones shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play by the cobra's hole, and the weaned child shall put his hand in the viper's den. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And in that day there shall be a root of Jesse who shall stand as a banner to the people for the Gentiles shall seek him and his resting place shall be glorious. I mean, obviously that's Jesus. He said, come to me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest. And here we uh, are finding out that uh, the Lord's resting place will be glorious. And this is speaking of the kingdom age. And um, the whole thing is going to be a Sabbath rest. That's a little bit about um, how this all sort of coheres together nicely on the top timeline. The bottom timeline, this is the only game in town if you're an atheist. You have to, you have to believe in some sort of long, drawn-out evolutionary process because you just can't imagine things evolving overnight. So you've got to inflate the, the time block. You've got to make it billions of years, Right? And the wonder of it all, the, you know, the big question I have is, why would a Christian adopt this? And it just seems to me, without being too hard on people, we, we, we don't say things to hurt people's feelings or be hard on them. It's just that I feel like it's in some way, shape, or form, a lot of people are giving more authority to man in his opinions than to what God says in his word. 
You know, but all the scientists in the world agree that evolution is true. Yeah, but even if that were true, that wouldn't mean anything. <laughs> would, it, would it really? I mean, not really. By the way, what are you going to do now with other things that all the scientists in the world disagree on? How about the virgin birth? I mean, all these naturalistic, evolutionary, atheistic scientists, all of them, to a man, deny the virgin birth of Jesus. How about his resurrection from the dead? How about raising Lazarus? How about walking on water? They, they deny all that. And yet we want to affirm those things? We'll disagree with those guys on that, but we won't disagree with them on the age of the earth and the order of events in early earth history. So I think that we're being a little inconsistent here when we operate like that. I think the Bible's straightforward teaching in, in Genesis is sufficient. And when you add to that all the promises of restoration, of going back to Genesis, that's the promise. That's what we're looking forward to. We want to be restored to what we were. If evolution is true, we're just going to be restored back to more death because that's what's always been here. And that doesn't sound very exciting to me, right? We pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Because we know it's going to be better when he comes back, right? Right. So, any questions or comments about that? I just wanted to share a couple things about the flood yet before we're done here tonight. But any, right here at this little break point, is there any questions, concerns, or comments about anything we just looked at? Has there been any uh, fancy mathematicians come up with odds of that Big Bang Theory actually being real? I'm not sure. <laughs> you can play with numbers any way you want, right? I do know that um, the last I heard, um, it, given a Big Bang scenario and all the parameters that, that could be altered just a little bit, I'm told that the Big Bang could have produced 10 to the 500th power number of universes. And only a very tiny infinitesimal sliver of those universes would have been life permitting. So some cosmologists are looking at that seriously and saying, well, this universe that's permitting life to exist is sort of poised on a knife edge here. Change one thing and embodied interactive agents like ourselves cannot survive. Much less, I mean, I mean, really interact and make meaningful scientific discoveries. So some cosmologists are starting to think theistically. They're starting to lean in that direction. But it's a bit misguided, right? Because they're assuming that the universe was born in a Big Bang, which we reject. But, you know, I guess maybe you want, if they want to climb that ladder out of the hole and then find Jesus and then throw away the ladder, that'd be fine, I guess. <laughs> I guess that'd be okay, too. But. Uh, any other thoughts or comments on that? Okay. Yeah? I just had one comment sure. that occurred to me when you were talking about the theistic evolutionists, like, I'm curious at what point they would say that God added, like, a spiritual nature, you know, was there an Adam at some point, yeah. and he was now, had a soul, but his mother and father were Neanderthals that didn't, Yeah, it just doesn't make sense. They do teach that, that is exactly what they teach, that uh, if you're a theistic evolutionist, man's physical nature we did get from the lower life forms, the ape-like creatures, right? And at some point, God breathed life into two descendants of these ape-like creatures. Where that is, who knows, right? William Lane Craig thinks it's somewhere between Homo habilis and Homo erectus or something. It's all speculation, right? But you got a guy like Hugh Ross. Who remembers Hugh Ross? We talked about him last time, okay? What does Hugh Ross believe about the six days of creation? Each day is a... Long period of time, maybe hundreds of millions of years. So he, he trusts the fossil record. He trusts the dating scheme, right? Hugh Ross does. So you ask Hugh Ross, well, what about Neanderthal man who lived so long ago before God supposedly breathed life into the first man that you recognize as a man? And he would tell you those, those individuals are not human. And that's, that is a horrible philosophy because these guys look human. Uh, they made jewelry. They buried their dead. They used red okra in their burials. They made weapons with super glue. We would have a hard time duplicating today. These guys made boats. They look human. 
They functioned as humans. They spoke. They had a language. But because they're too far away on the timeline, even though they look human and behave like humans, they're not human. That means if you killed one, you wouldn't be guilty of murder. This is a nightmarish sort of philosophy. I don't think we want to go down that road where you can kill people who look human because you've determined for some reason or other they're not actually human. That is a deadly philosophy. So I don't, I don't affirm that. By the way, who's ever heard of carbon-14 dating? Yeah, I'm sure you've all heard of carbon-14 dating. The whole thing is arbitrary and self-serving, folks. Uh, I know for a fact the Amund one Neanderthal was carbon-dated and he was given an age of 6,000 years. Well, that's way too young for an evolutionist, so guess what they did with that carbon date? Well, it must have been contaminated. We got a wrong date. Looks too young. But here's the thing. When you do a radiocarbon date on something, the technique itself destroys part of your sample, so you make darn sure that there's no signs of contamination before you administer that test. So the object, the skull in this case, didn't look contaminated. But it brought back a date the evolutionists didn't like, and therefore it must be contaminated, you see? And that's how this works. It's circular, it's self-serving, and I kind of don't think it's real science, <laughs> because their presuppositions are coloring everything that they're doing. And it's actually becoming a hindrance to intelligent scientific research. But I want to talk about the flood here. Can we go to Genesis chapter 6 here for just a minute? Genesis 6. We want to talk about the flood and as you're locating Genesis 6, um, can anyone tell me, please, why the flood is significant in this? Why are we going to pay attention to the flood now? What is significant in this battle over the age of the earth and over the days of creation and all that? Why are we paying attention to the flood? Uh, Peter? I would say it accounts for everything that we see, like the fossil record and everything. What we think happened in a matter of days, they think happened over millions of years, billions of years, right? That's right. Okay, so according to the Bible, God judged the world in the days of Noah with a global aquatic catastrophe. It lasted 371 days. That is a titanic amount of water sloshing over the earth. It's going to leave a mark geologically, right? So we say... I think most of us here would say that what we're seeing out there geologically, rocks, fossils, canyons, and all, name it all, the features, most of them, that's due to the flood or post-flood catastrophism. If you're an evolutionist, the flood is denied outright. There is no flood here in this story, right? So the geological features of the earth are the result of long ages of time. Now what are you going to do if you are a Christian and you want to believe this interpretation of the rocks and fossils. Now what are you going to do with the flood? Because the rocks and fossils and geological features are either the result of the flood, or it's endless ages of time, slow uniform process, but it cannot be both. So Hugh Ross, who believes the secular dating schemes and interpretations of the fossils and rocks, he says the flood of Noah's day was a local flood, it was not worldwide. If you ask him, he's, he says, oh, I believe in a universal flood. It flooded Noah's little universe. It's deceptive, right, to talk like that. Um, Norm Geisler was a brilliant Christian philosopher and apologist, but, and he sided with Hugh Ross. They worked together. But Geisler wasn't so foolish as to say the flood was local. He could read the language in Genesis. He saw it was universal. But he believed in a tranquil flood. Like the waters came up, Killed everybody, went back down, didn't leave a trace. Impossible. You might as well talk about flaming snow or something, because that doesn't happen. That doesn't happen. But let's look at the, the flood account here. Genesis chapter 6, verse 11. Let's look at... And we're looking for indications that the flood was global in extent and catastrophic in nature. Genesis 6, 11. The earth also was corrupt before God. And the earth was filled with violence. So God looked upon the earth, and indeed it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. And God said to Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them. And behold, I will destroy them with the earth. That sounds pretty widespread. That sounds catastrophic in nature. 
And now just look, please, at Genesis 7 and verse 17. 7, 17. Okay. Chapter 7, verse 17. Now the flood was on the earth 40 days. The waters increased and lifted up the ark and rose high above the earth. The waters prevailed greatly uh, and greatly increased on the earth. And the ark moved about on the surface of the waters. And the waters prevailed exceedingly on the earth. And all the high hills under the whole heaven were covered. Just note that. All the high hills under the whole heaven were covered. You know, you know, you know what gravity is? Mm-hmm. Just cover the highest hill and you covered them all. Isn't that right? Yeah. Verse 20. The waters prevailed 15 cubits upward and the mountains were covered. 15 cubits, 22 feet above the highest mountain peak at that time. And all the earth, all the flesh died that moved on the earth, birds and cattle and beasts and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth and every man, all in whose nostrils was the, bre- was the breath of the spirit of life, all that was on the dry land died. So he destroyed all living things which were on the face of the ground, both man and cattle, creeping thing and bird of the air. Only uh, they were destroyed from the earth. Only Noah and those who were with him in the ark remained alive. And the waters prevailed on the earth 150 days. So we get the idea that we had a hard rain coming down for uh, 40 days and 40 nights, but the waters increased in depth, eh? For 150 days. Kept rising, rising, rising. The waters prevailed, and the whole face of the earth was covered. As you read the account, you're going to see there's about 30 references to the worldwide, ex- the worldwide extent of the flood. Global extent, catastrophic in nature. The flood, 371 days, that's a long time for a local flood, I think. The ark was positively huge. <laughs> uh, if you read the account there, um, God said, uh, Noah, make this boat 300 cubits long, 50 cubits wide, and 30 cubits high. A cubit from the elbow to the fingertip, the middle finger, on average, 18 inches. So the ark is at least 450 feet long, at least. But Moses, well, he's writing about this, and uh, he was raised in Egypt, and a royal Egyptian cubit is 20.62 inches, so that ark could have been 515 feet in length. Who knows? It's a gigantic barge designed to take representatives of two air-breathing land-dwelling animals. Um, Why was this necessary? Birds could fly away from a local flood. This is... Pointless, right? It just seems pointless. At the end of the flood account in Genesis 9, God put a rainbow in the sky, and he said, I will never do this again. I will never flood the world like this. And yet, haven't we experienced large-scale local catastrophes, floods? We've seen local floods. But God said he wouldn't flood the world like that again. It seems like, is God lying? Impossible. God can't lie. To even ask the question is getting in the realm of blasphemy, I think, maybe. But God doesn't lie. He makes promises he's going to keep. He's not going to flood the world like that again. And uh, finally, um, if you go to 2 Peter 3, remember Peter's our great uh, cosmologist of Scripture. If you go to 2 Peter 3, the last chapter Peter ever wrote, you're going to see that Peter agrees with Jesus because Jesus, in Matthew 24... Uh, he likened the coming global judgment to the judgment that occurred in the days of Noah. In the days of Noah, God judged the entire world for sin. When Jesus returns, he'll judge the whole world. Uh, no one says, well, local judgment in the days of Noah, so when Jesus returns, local judgment, maybe I'll hide somewhere, and Jesus won't see me. No, that's not how it's going to happen. Global extent back then, global extent today, Uh, Remember in Matthew 24, Jesus said, uh, as it was in the days of Noah, it will be like that in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. People were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day Noah entered the ark, and the flood came and took them all away. Who? The wicked. The flood came and took them all away. And um, Peter agrees with Jesus when it comes to the parallel between the worldwide judgment in the days of Noah, worldwide judgment in uh, the second coming of Jesus, Look at 2 Peter 3 
and uh, verse 5, talking about the scoffers in the last days, 3, 5. For this they willingly forget that by the word of God the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, by which the world that then existed perished, being flooded with water. So he says in the last days people will deliberately forget about, ignore, suppress, deny the doctrines of creation and the flood, which is where we're at. Verse 7 now, But the heavens and the earth which are now preserved by the same word are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. It's the parallelism here. Worldwide judgment back then, going to be a worldwide judgment uh, when Jesus returns, and he will judge the world in righteousness. In righteousness doth he judge and make war. And um, just as we bring this lecture to a close here, I just want to mention some of the amazing parallels between the ark that was mankind's only salvation in the days of Noah and Jesus Christ, which is our only salvation against the coming judgment. In both cases, it was the exclusive channel of salvation. There was no other way to escape. You, you, you're in the ark and you escape the flood, or you're in Jesus and you escape the coming judgment. Notice, please, that in the account that we read, Moses thought it was important to tell us that the ark was lifted up above the earth. Mankind's only salvation was there between heaven and earth. The waters of the flood lifted the ark. We probably could have figured that out, but Moses thought it was important to write about it. Just like Jesus said, if I am lifted up, I will draw all men to myself. There, mankind's only salvation was also lifted between heaven and earth as well. Um, remember that as God uh, gave instructions to Noah on how to build the ark, he said, put a hole in the side. There'll be a door in the side where the animals and the people can enter. And Jesus Christ, accomplishing his redemptive work on the cross, had his side open too by the Roman spear. When the ark had accomplished its saving work and it was done, it landed up high in the mountains. When Jesus finished his redemptive work, he ascended to the third heaven. And there's many, many parallels to this, right? The ark came through a baptism of water and the dove returned to it. Jesus was baptized in the Jordan and, and the dove, the Holy Spirit, bodily form of a dove, alighted on him. And you can go, you know, on and on and on with these amazing parallels and themes and things that connect and hang together all the way through the Bible, all indicators of a super and divine intelligence behind the whole thing. And this is a beautiful, joyful, lifelong thing to study the Bible and to discover these magnificent things. Very encouraging too, isn't it? So, so that's the end of my prepared um, material here. I knocked off two lectures to, in short order, so I think we'll be able to be finished um, before Arnie comes, and then um, we won't have any loose ends, okay? Any final thoughts, questions, or comments? Yeah, Peter. Um, in Psalm 104, uh, 6 through 8, it talks about how I uh, uh, receded the waters, the uh, valleys sank, and the mountains rose. Is that talking about creation, or is that talking about the flood? I think that's talking about the flood. Okay. There. So yeah. would you say that as the water proceeded, God changed the terrain? The flood rearranged all the real estate, for sure. And uh, I wasn't going to get into, again, this is a creation basic, so I'm not going to get into all the science. Maybe uh, in the future I'll take this church through my 20-hour module on creation, where we do go into the science. But if anyone here is interested, I would uh, recommend that you go to creationscience.com. Or just Google Walter Brown and the hydroplate theory. He's got his own theory for how the flood occurred. He's got proposed energy, energy forces and mechanisms that he thinks were at work. And in, as far as I'm concerned, um, there's a number of competing models for what happened in the days of Noah that try to be consistent with the scriptures and consistent with the scientific data. You have to make a model, right, or propose a model that can do this. His model, Walt Brown's model, is the very best, head and shoulders above every other model. So I would just encourage you, if this is interesting to you, check out Walter Brown. Uh, his online book is called In the Beginning. First edition came out in 1989. I think he's up to the ninth edition right now. It's all online. It's all free. 
And I think there's some videos on YouTube now that animate the hydroplate theory. But he shows you all you have to assume. Number one, the Earth is a globe. That's not a huge assumption. You have to assume that gravity has been gravity all the way through Earth history. And you have to assume that uh, underneath the, the granite that makes up the continents, ten, say 10 miles down under the granite, there was once an ocean, which we do see in some of the other planets, and there's still quite a bit of water under the Earth now. He says, all you need to assume are those things and let gravity do its stuff. And he just spells it all out for you. And he answers, I think he's got about 25 unique and strange uh, features that are hard to explain on the earth that that theory will explain. So there, I just gave a commercial for Dr. Brown. I hope he's very appreciative. <laughs> he doesn't know we exist. <laughs> That's okay. Uh, any other thoughts or questions there on anything we covered? Yeah, Dan. Uh, just, uh, just a little bit of a confusing thing regarding the... Uh, regarding the, the, the uh, the, the theistic, uh, like, like the ones that try and uh, uh, deem it a local flood there, like e e even uh, even like biblical, uh, uh, I guess, uh, evolutionists or whatever. Uh, it just doesn't make sense to me that they, that they could even call it a local flood with the uh, with the fact that, you know, it says he covered like the highest mountains and, and stuff like that. Like, I mean, yeah. even if it were local, like would it, ha it, it would have to have been like, basically like one kilo of water like where else is that water going to go exactly like it, like yeah. it's got to cover the yeah. entire the they entire might call it mythology uh, it depends right there are, there are lots of ways around this you can call it mythology yeah. historical fiction you could call it hyperbole whatever but as you read it if you're just sort of honest and you just sort of your best you can lay aside your presuppositions and just let the narrative talk to you it just comes at you like straightforward historical narrative. Genesis 1 to 11 just looks like it's telling a story the same as Genesis 12 to 50, you know? And that's how the New Testament treats it, and that'll be our topic next week. We're going to go to the New Testament record. We'll see how the New Testament handles these things. So, Yeah, Jared. One of the things I've been noticing how the seculars have been, or the almost secular deists have been, Arguing the flood records is first of all they're arguing that there's two flood stories and of course hooking it all as oh being written as a story based off of like the Eluma Elish or something yeah. like that yeah yeah um and so they're trying to really push the um, Bible uh, countering itself thing like they'll look and be like go oh, I think later in a Exodus or something like that where it talks about the flood later on like oh see these don't mess uh, the timeline that the ark was going doesn't uh, match up the animals that were brought doesn't mm -hmm. match up and all these things of course I there's many answers to them but do you have any way like we might like I've been encountering them on the more academic level but do you think yeah. that have you seen that more on the streets like it would like yeah I've heard of this stuff before but for me yeah our, our marching orders are to preach the gospel, right? So I would tell people about Jesus and what he's done. Mm -hmm. And I would keep that conversation on him and say, and just let people know he believed this. Mm -hmm. And I think he knows what he's talking about. He's the son of God. Mm -hmm. And I would just argue mostly from that perspective there. We could certainly go into geology and, and paleontology, and we could talk about the feasibility studies, which have been done on Noah's Ark, to show that it was seaworthy and it could hold the animal kinds as described in the Bible. We could talk about all that, but I think I want to stick with Jesus as long as possible and just let him do the talking. Because really, these questions, for the most part, for the most part, they're not honest. These are dodges. Uh, these are a desperate attempt to find some way to legitimately deny the Bible and not have to get under God's moral authority, right? We know that. We know what they're up to. So Preach the gospel to these people, I recommend, and, and keep the spotlight on Jesus, and let's hear what he has to say about this. As much as possible, yeah. John? Yeah. I heard um, that many cultures actually have a story of a large flood, besides the Christian and Jewish <laughs> account. Is that true? That's true. So the last I checked, there's over 270 flood stories um, but held by ancient people groups who are separated by oceans and mountains. So the, the missionaries that came across the ocean to the New World were astounded 
that the First Nations peoples had a flood story. Mm-hmm. And their guy was commanded to build a giant canoe and, and put animals on it and all this kind of stuff. They, they were astounded. I have a book in my library. It's called, uh, written by two secularist thinkers. It's called Ancient Mysteries Revealed. And these guys are going to explain you know, how the pyramids were built and how this was done and how that was done. They're going to explain it all. And then this book, when they get to the flood story, the unanimity of these flood accounts all over the world, they, t- they say in the book, we're stumped. We no longer have a plausible naturalistic explanation for this. That was my next question. They don't have one. <laughs> Those guys, they point out that in Peru, they got a flood story there right. involving someone getting drunk after the flood. <laughs> and that's a little ways from the Holy Land. Oh, yeah. But of course, we understand that we all have a common uh, heritage and ancestry back to Noah's family, don't we? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a really good, I think, piece of anthropological evidence that we could point out to people, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, Prudence? So how do you handle the fact that a lot of our mainstream, even in Focus in the Dan, and people who used to follow them for advice are going over to old earth and evolution, people who used to trust. Yeah. So how do you handle well, things they used to teach, they used to trust? And, you yeah, know you've got to follow like, Peter's advice. Second Peter 3, Peter said, you know, don't follow the opinions of untaught and unstable men. They're twisting the scriptures to their own destruction. So we don't want to do that. I think we could pray for these people and these ministries. And maybe we could point out the inconsistencies here. Like I, I think if I'm dealing with a Christian minister, I probably wouldn't touch any of the science that's out there. I'd want to, if he affirms the Bible, hey, let's just talk Bible and let's show, like, look, this is a pretty consistent thing here that we believe. And yet trying to harmonize it with an evolution story is seeming, it seems like it does great violence to the Bible. And I would try to argue that way. But what? With, with gentleness and respect, Peter says. Reverence and fear, right? And of course, you and I aren't going to be able to do that. We get all upset and stuff. You won't be able to do it unless you do the other thing Peter said. And that is to sanctify the Lord Jesus in your heart. Sanctify him as Lord first. Then we can set about to the apologetical task, right? Yeah. The Grand Canyon. Yeah. It says it all. <laughs> I think so. Yeah. I think so too. By the way, Walt Brown has an excellent um, treatment of the Grand Canyon in his book. And for your information, he lives in Arizona. And I was told many years ago, uh, representatives from the major creation science organizations were invited to all gather at the Grand Canyon for a weekend to each share their flood model and how it would account for the features at Grand Canyon. Dr. Brown went first. Everyone went home. (laughs) They couldn't do better. They could not do better. Check that out. It's 12 miles wide, a mile deep. You can't even see the river down there. Yeah. And many strange, unique features in the canyon that a, that a catastrophe can explain, I think, account for very nicely. Yeah. Okay, guys, I'll close us off with a prayer. And then you're certainly welcome to stay in fellowship if you like. Dear Holy God, dear blessed Redeemer, we come before you in the mighty and precious name of Jesus. We thank you, Lord, for being here with us tonight and for leading and guiding the study. And thank you that we were able to get through the prepared material. And Lord, we just thank you for every opportunity to study and share and to marvel at uh, your written record, your revelation in the Bible. We pray, Lord, you'd seal truths from the scriptures into our hearts and minds that we can call upon for encouragement and that we might be a bold witness and an encouragement to others also. And may these things be so. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Praise God. God bless you all.